Good evening, and it's been a while, friends, but we are back. And thanks for joining us for another episode of Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain. Thanks for joining us live tonight. We've got a lot to talk about this, this evening. We've got our live uh, panelists here to answer your questions. Tonight, we've got John Bodensteiner, Don White, and Marty Alanya. And I thought you guys were supposed to introduce yourself. So you know what? I'm a little rusty. <laughs> it's been a while since I've been here. So pretend I didn't say their names, and we're going to have them say their own names. So you, sir. Yes, I, my name hasn't changed, so you were correct. <laughs> I'm uh, a Vermillion County Master Gardener, and uh, I, uh, my specialties are if it's green and growing, I try to get my finger into it a little bit. There's no plant really that I found that I really don't like, uh, even to the point of which I'll get into here in just a few minutes. And he is our resident uh, hosta expert, yes. I learned very early on. Okay. Don't forget the maters. He's and yeah. the maters, that's he's, right. He's an amazing mater man. <laughs> All right, next. Don White, I'm an emeritus professor of plant pathology from the University of Illinois. Uh, while at the university, I taught uh, introductory plant pathology, diseases of field crops, diseases of ornamentals and turf grasses, and did research on corn diseases after retirement, I got bored and I became a master gardener, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Okay, wonderful. And last but not least. Hello, my name is Marty Alanya. I'm a retired landscaper. We were just discussing how old we are um, and decrepit too. So <laughs> that's why I retired. Um, I, I really enjoy perennials and shrubs. The, the small landscape um, homeowners is kind of what I do. So. Okay. Bring on the questions. So we've got a wide breadth of knowledge here at the table tonight, and then there's me I'm down at the end. Uh, just a <coughs> reminder, we are live, and you can give us a call and ask questions. 333-3495 is the number. So always first round out of the gate, we do show and tells. So, John, we'll start with you. Uh, what would you bring for us okay, tonight? Okay, my show and tell tonight today is we're getting to that point where I've been getting seed catalogs by the, by, you know, every day I have to go out, otherwise my mailbox is full. And so I thought, you know, being we're getting that time of the season, it's start time to start talking about seeds and what we're going to need to do as far as ordering them, finding them, finding the right ones. And then once we get them, we're going to start them at home. What is the correct procedure? And, you know, there's, like I said earlier, there's a few that are, I, I, I buy from catalogs if I have to. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a few things like, dandelion, white dandelion, or pink dandelion, <laughs> or Cape gooseberry, which is a ground cherry. Yeah. And <clears throat> it is. <laughs> then there's like rat tail radish, uh, which is, you know, there's green ones and there's purple ones. I found this purple one and I found this locally. So if you can find them locally, I would really, because you can read the packet. A lot of times the catalogs will describe it, <clears throat> but um, um, and, and just because I've got this and I had it last year doesn't mean I have to order new ones. There are a lot of, there's a lot of information. This is, this is the seed saving guide. Um, but some things are good for more than five years. Some mm -hmm. things are only good for one year, but there are guides out there that will tell you whether they're good for one year, mm -hmm. two years, how to keep them. Mm -hmm. it, it tells you how to store them and the best thing like that. <clears throat> now, Probably the next, once you get your seeds and you're getting ready to, to start, probably the most important thing is seed starting mix. Don't put them in soil or anything like that, garden mm -hmm. soil, because you're going to end up with diseases like damping off. You're going to have maybe seeds that were out there that you didn't plant, but mm -hmm. somebody else planted or blew in. So this is a nice sterile uh, solution. It's There's no soil in it, so it's very good as far as um, being sterile oh. and um, you know what you're going to have coming up. Next thing, and I've got all kinds of goodies here, <laughs> is the size of a container you're going to start things in. You can start things in in things like this. This is very, very few. I, I mean, there's quite a few in that. Then yeah. what I'm the next out. thing you want to yeah. consider is <laughs> does it technical issues. <laughs> does it require does it require heat? So this has got a little tray in it and it's got heating mat in it because some seeds require heat to, to they, you know to uh, germinate. Um, and it you know one nice thing is if you look at the seed packet 
all that information is going to be on the back of it. So it's very important that you read the seed packet. And, you know, it's going to tell you whether it grows in sun. If you've got a shady garden, you may as well not buy the seed because um, it's okay. going to uh, yeah, okay. not grow very well. Maybe. Moisture is another thing. Uh, once you plant them, it helps if you can put like a little greenhouse. So these are greenhouse covers. Mm -hmm. And um, if you want to plant a whole bunch rather than that bigger one, then you can go to this, which is almost twice as many. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then once you get them out of that, you transplant them. And you don't transplant them out of here into this, this, the original one until they reach, get their true leaves. Mm -hmm. second the second set. set of true leaves. Mm -hmm. The first ones are cotyledons. Yeah. Those, they don't count. And, and I've seen people <laughs> take like this, this size and um, dump a whole, they, they put the seed starting in there, dump a whole packet in there, and then they'll transplant them into this or into this other size. It depends on how much work and how, how much uh, you want to put in. There are other sizes where if you want to do, maybe you only want to do four. And, mm -hmm. and they have them. And then there's these that fit into the, the large tray, which will um, accommodate a lot more. I made a mess here, too. <laughs> uh, one other thing. Um, moisture and light, very yeah. important. Once the, your plants um, emerge, you're going to want to probably have to supplement a little bit of light. Uh, usually they say keep the light about one inch above the plant so that they don't burn. But our light is not like the sun. If you get it too far away, it's probably not going to do uh, very good on that. Uh, the other thing that I found, and I'm teaching my kids at, at Schlarman Greenhouse, um, get a fan. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have, you don't want a big box fan that's going to blow them from this side over to that side <laughs> of the room, but just enough so that the plants move. You're going to be amazed at how stockier the stems and mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. become. So um, sure. lots of good information. If you are interested in starting seeds, go to your extension office, go online. Mm -hmm. There's just tons, but it's sometimes a little bit more complicated than just throwing seeds and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, that mm -hmm. type of thing. So And read your seed packets. And read your yes. seed packets. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Great like information. The same guy does the seed packets as the labels, and I think we discussed that earlier, yes. children. We read have. The label. Read it. <laughs> There's a little Bob Cratchit right in the tiny writing. Just come on. Reading is Give him a reason to live. Okay. Okay. Don, we're moving on to you. Yes, I've got a show and tell, and I, I don't have anything to put out here. It's on peach leaf curl. Next slide. Now, this is a disease uh, on peach. Now, there's also plum pockets, and it affects plum trees, as the name would suggest. The leaves are going to be twisted and curled. Next. Red in color, next. And sometimes it's really dis disfigured. Now, the thing of it is that you need to think about this disease now if you had it last year. Mm -hmm. Because what happens here, this fungus survives in bark crevices, okay? And it's spread to the seed from the bark crevices. Next slide. Here it is again. I think they're kind of pretty. Next slide. Now, these are fungal structures on the leaf, and they're little balloon-like structures that are called naked assai. And you can see the, the colored reddish things in there. Those are the ascospores. Mm -hmm. That will be on the diseased leaf. These will break open. Those spores will spread to the bark. The fungus will grow like a yeast fungus in bark crevices and increase its population in the bark crevices. It does not usually go and attack more leaves on that same tree because once the leaf has a waxy layer on it, it's, it's resistant to immune. Okay. So this is one cycle a year, spring of the year. One thing you can do is spray fungicides and you spray it while the plant's dormant. If I had a plant that had a lot of trouble, I think I'd be spraying it as soon as it warmed back up. Playing with chlorothalonil and there's a number of other materials that'll work. And then spray again right as buds swell and things get to start to open. And that's the way you do it. So now's a good time to go buy your fungicide and get ready. So by warm, you mean 
50 degrees, 60 degrees? Yeah, I just get it so it didn't form ice on the trunk. Okay. 50 or 60 I degrees see, would be I fine. Thought, I thought the homeowner might yeah. want to know exactly how warm do you mean. So. Yeah. Okay. All right, before we move on to you, Marty, i just let you know we are live and we do want your phone call. So give us a call, 333-3495 to get your questions answered by the experts. You like that? Yes. Okay. That's fabulous. So okay. you have um, a show and tell. I have a show and tell that also answers a question. Okay. Our, we have a viewer named William, and he likes to make his own trellises out of galvanized electrical conduit and trellis netting, but his trellis netting just doesn't hold up, and he tries to clean it off, and it's and it needs holes in it large enough to pick the vegetables through, and it's 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 just not it's not working for him, William. You're welcome. Tonight is your night, baby. Tonight is your night. I tried to get to this the last time I was on, and we couldn't manage to do it. Now, I this is what I use. I know they're only vegetables, but... Okay. Tell me what you need me to do. Okay. You can hold the T-pole. Okay. But sometimes they need a corral suitable for cattle or hogs. <laughs> so I use galvanized cattle or hog panels. You can notice that... The bottom, the sections are closer together, and as they go up, they get larger and larger. This is easily large enough to get about any tomato you grow through the hole, right? This is what I use. I took this out of my garden today, okay? Um, you can, these, the hog panels are taller, the cattle panels are, the cattle panels are taller, the hog panels are a little bit shorter, they're all made of galvanized metal. I cut these to length. This was actually a scrap that I just put up because I needed something to grow peas on. I had something else I was using. But it comes in like 16, 20 foot lengths. So there's no end to the size. I mean, I can't imagine you needing a size that you can't figure it out on. Oh, yeah. And also, okay. So I mount these on, I know you're using galvanized conduit, but we'll take the, the T-pole here. These, can you hold that yeah. for a second? Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Peoples, they have a uh, spade on the bottom so they don't spin in the ground. They, when you drive them in from the top with a sledgehammer, they go in and they stay there. Okay, that's a little stabilizer. So I can drive them in the ground and then they have these little bumps on them every two and a half inches or so. If you put that on there, all you need is a zip tie. Mm -hmm. It just works perfectly. And you can cut them off at the end of the year. You can leave it. You can use wire and just, you know, anything you can attach them with. On your conduit, you may have to use wire so it won't slip. On these, you can make it as high or as low as you want. If you need a trellis this high off the ground mm -hmm. or only a few inches off the ground, you can do that. I like to, when I grow seeds on these, that's perfect where the spaces are smaller mm -hmm. because they can grab on quickly. And then they just climb right up and they do really well. Um, you may have to figure out a bracket system or maybe drill some holes in your conduit to put a wire through. But also, um, these are galvanized, just like your poles. So, William, you can set these right on the ground if they're tall enough. And you won't have to worry about mm -hmm. tying them up high and attaching them. All you need to do is keep them from falling over. You can also turn them this way. And like I said, they come in like 20 foot lengths, 16, 12, 10, eight, something like that. So I don't think you're gonna grow anything bigger than those. And, and it's versatile and it's, functional. And it's weatherproof like crazy. And now, Stay. William, your trellis problems <laughs> have come to an end. That's right. <laughs> William will be prepared <laughs> all right. this spring. Thank I'm you so much. I'm helping you all I can there, bud. All right, we're going to go to the phones. We've got a couple calls. Jillian in Springfield is on the line and has a question about planting grass seed. Jillian, go ahead. Um, we had a huge sycamore tree taken out of our front yard last spring. Um, what do we do to prepare the soil in order to plant grass seed? And we had the um, root ground out, too. And what type of grass seed do you recommend? Okay, what, what, probably yeah. the first thing you want to do is uh, you'd like to go in and do a soil test, mm -hmm. see what the pH is, and uh, get an idea of the nutrients. Now, for seeding grass, the best time to do it is in the fall. 
You'd like to get it in the last week of August, first week of September, because that is past the time that crabgrass seed will germinate. If you plant it in the spring, the crabgrass seed also germinates and you're going to have a problem with that. So I'd go ahead and do it in, in fall seeding. The uh, best grasses, that, the grass that I really like are the turf grass tall fescues. And there's a lot of really good ones that have been cranked out in the last 10 years. They don't go into stress like bluegrass does. And like a friend of mine says, Kentucky bluegrass belongs in Kentucky, not Illinois. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, happy here. It, it's, a, it's a good, uh, the tall fescues are really nice and they do very well. And they don't go into stress as bad with the, the moisture and things like that. So you're going to be looking at a mess for a while, but you're better off seeding in the fall. Okay. You get right. a better establishing turf. Anybody else have anything to can, chime in? No, it, she doesn't have to wait till next fall. She could wait to, or do it this spring, but early, it's going to take a lot more work for her. She's going to keep it. She's going to need to keep it watered and yeah. and um, you know, it, it, like Don said, it's much much better to do it in the fall because yeah. the weather cools off. You know, depending on this year, you may if we have a cool spring, it may be okay. But then once summer comes, those plants are are still the roots aren't there, and they're going to stress. They're going to stress very easily. One thing that I did on a couple yards was to broadcast oat seed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the oats would come up, they'd grow, you could mow them, they were a little bit different color, they looked kind of mm -hmm. weird, it'd stop like the traffic out on the road if they were driving by. <laughs> but then, after you're done with your oat crop, at the end of the summer, go ahead and just spray it with Roundup, kill it all down, plant your grass seed into that. They, they've got this Canadian grass too that is an annual. They, yep. they advertise it, it's going to green up your lawn immediately, uh, but it's an annual. They don't they don't tell you that when you buy that. <laughs> but yeah. that's something else that you could plant and then intermix your because it's going to yeah. offer a little bit of shade. Of course, it's going to if you plant it too thick, it's going to do a lot of competition to your new seeds, mm -hmm. to your actual grass seeds. But it would give it some cover so that they don't wash away and 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 uh, okay. from the watering. But. I would also add, I don't, you didn't say, you said you had the stump ground, but you didn't say if you took the shavings out, because the, they're not, the grass isn't going to grow well there. You think, oh, it's just gone. It's not gone. It's never mm. gone until, it, until those rot away. And even then, they take a lot of nitrogen out of the soil. So you're better off to um, have the stump ground by all means, but then take those out and replace them with soil, with topsoil. And um, also, I just had an enormous tree stump removed from my yard this fall, <laughs> and we moved a shed, and we moved a massive man-eating forsythia. So I'm going to have to do a little planning, and I'm not going all summer with mud. So <laughs> I'm going to plant plan my back. Spray. Yeah, we're building a garage, and, and I have a lot of torn up stuff, and I'm going to have to be doing some grass myself. I personally prefer uh, perennial ryegrass. It germinates very quickly. Um, it's rugged. It can stand some shade and all of a sudden you can give it. And I have a dog and we garden and yeah, you know, so, yeah. you know, it needs right. to be sturdy. Well, you got options. There we go. All right. Kathy and Champagne with a question about cone flowers. Go ahead, Kathy. Yeah. Hi. I've called before because I have the cone flowers that went crazy um, with all of these fungus heads on the top of them. Mm -hmm. um, it was something that they say won't go away. Take out the cone flowers and get rid of them. Will I ever be able to put cone flowers anywhere near that area um, again? I think they're saying five years. It's the, And I'm trying to remember the name of the disease. Um, it's one of those that it, it, it's, it's, it, it originates in another, but it really affects Cold flowers, but I think that it's kind of like hosta dis diseases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to wait five years and not plant anything that's in that family in that soil because they Just will reside. Keep living Maybe there. They, you won't see it, but it's subclinical, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, five years. Five years, I would say, would be the magic, and and then kind of watch things that are don't plant anything that's in that cone flower family. Okay. All right, we're going to Hattie in Springfield with a question about daffodils. Hattie, go ahead. Um, my daffodils are coming out of the ground, and I put extra mulch on them. 
it, I mean, is it way too early for them to become an up? <laughs> it got warm enough, they're coming up is yeah, the problem. a little confused. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have maple trees that are, are budding. Yeah. Uh, and that means I'm not going to get any sap this year for my syrup. Because it's, it's too or early. it's going to be diminished. So they'll likely get killed back a little yeah. bit. But the, they'll come back. Yeah, yeah. the daffodils, the, the leaves come up first, even if they get nipped a little bit some some frost. It's not a big deal. You'll probably get flowers anyway uh, because they come on a little later. I think the extra mulch was probably a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Just get a little it's going to keep it protection. more stable. But they're, I mean, gosh, you know, daffodils, <laughs> they grow in They're Canada. ready. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it okay. time? Is it time? Yeah, God knows when the <laughs> daffodils can come up and still make it, so it's not a big deal. Okay. Terry in Bloomington with a question about tiny pines. Go ahead, Terry. Hi. Um, I got for Christmas a beautiful three, four foot tall pine tree. One of those weeping needles, it's short needles. Can they be planted outside or are they too North delicate? Um, yeah. I think it's Norfolk. No. Yeah, no. It's yeah, it's a house plant. Mm. Yeah, those aren't here. Hardy. It is those yeah. aren't hardy. Yeah, here it's a, it's it's yeah. basically you have to wait till summertime. Yeah, and because uh, they will not survive here in the winter. No, you advise keeping it in a pot when yeah. she moves it outside for the summer, or yeah. can you she put it in, in the pot ground? In a pot, you know, I like yeah. to dig a pot, and you know, a double pot, and that way when you come fall, you just lift out the pot, leave that there, and, and fill it with leaves and. That okay. way in the yeah. spring you can you don't you didn't can... save the tag that tells you what it is do you no no i got a 50 dollar tree for five dollars and the tag was gone okay, okay. Yeah. i'm it's thinking probably if, it's, if you yeah. do if it's if you do a little like online research or ask uh one of your local garden centers to identify it for you if it's a norfolk island pine you can't yeah, put take a picture outside. of it and take it to the extension office. They yeah, can tell you what they it can is. tell you right away. It's very distinctive. Mm -hmm. So okay, all right, John. We're going back to you. Uh, this is Denise with a question. She says, "I have a Stanley prune plum tree. That's a tongue twister, which mm -hmm. has a black growth on the branches. I cut them all off last summer, and it keeps coming back. The tree grows well, but only once have I seen a few flowers on it in spring, and it has never produced any plums. Is there anything I can do to save it and maybe get some fruit?" Well, what she has is a, Stan well, like she said, is a Stanley prune plum, which is a European variety, mm -hmm. which unfortunately is that those, those types are the most susceptible to black knot disease, which is what she has there. The only way to really get rid of it, and, and this, this is, there's some on pretty, pretty substantial stems there, is to prune it out. Uh, you can also, there are some fungicides that you can spray in the spring, uh, that you know you're going to have to get rid of both that part of it and to spray it at the right time um, removing the source cleaning it up underneath making sure there's not another cherry cherry and plums are the two that get get the most of this mm -hmm. and so um, um, getting rid of it is very very important not only from that tree but every other tree in in, a, in the, the area uh, there are some fungicides available. I went to the extension office. The book is not available yet to tell us what the new recommendations are. There is some dormant sprays. Uh, a combination of both pruning and spraying is, is, is by far the best. When you are cleaning, you want to do it in the winter time and make sure you clean your pruning tools. Cut four to six inches past where the fungus is. There is one, I think if I saw, if that was mine, I would make a vertical cut at the ground and plant <laughs> a new one called President. It's, it's resistant to it. Okay, okay. awesome. Great information. Okay, uh, we're gonna skip to Marty okay. for a quick question because we're out in two minutes. Yep. Um, this is a dumpster plant ID. Debbie okay. wants to know, she says she rescued this plant from a dumpster in August 2018 and was wondering if you could identify it. So let's see it. We can. Drum roll. It's Evolvulus glomeratus. Ooh, she's so fancy with her big words. <laughs> <laughs> Bask in my glow. Yes. Um, the variety of this one is very likely Blue Days, B-L-U-E, second word days, D-A-Z-E, like you're in a daze, not four or five days. Um, it's widely available. It's uh, it's just beautiful. The blue is absolutely fabulous. It's just a really, it looks like our shirts, you know, it's hard to find that shade. So that's what it is. Evolvulus glomeratus. 
Evolvulus glomeratus. Blue days. Okay. Google so it. So we've got <laughs> we've got two minutes ish. Don, I don't know how long your your presentation is, or if you wanted to just talk about it a little I bit can, while we got some time. I can do the uh, fall fertilizer question okay, that I had. Let's do I that. Best. Let's do that. We had a, a question that came in by email that uh, she wanted to put on fer fall fertilizer. It was in October is when she sent the question in, mm -hmm. and you could in October, but do not put on fall fertilizer in most of the central U.S. after Thanksgiving, and in fact, you'd be better off putting it on earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, what you don't want to do is start to encourage growth mm -hmm. of the grass, have snow cover it, and then you end up with a fungus called snow mold, and that's another set of slides in a, <laughs> about, <laughs> and, and about 20 minutes worth of... <laughs> And Another I did that show. on my yard and made beautiful show. photographs, but I used it for class, but I don't want to do it again. Okay. Well, that's it. We're out of time. Thanks so much for watching. Please visit us on Facebook and Instagram to keep up on all things MAG. And, of course, email us your questions at yourgarden at gmail.com. We'll do our absolute best to get them answered. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Good night. <laughs>